Good afternoon from an exceptionally sunny London. My name is Susanne Oberhauser. I'm the head of the European Parliament Office in London. And in the name of both the London and the Dublin offices, we welcome you to this jointly organized webinar in the series Parliaments in Dialogue. Today, we are very pleased to have a brilliant panel with us, two members from the European Parliament, Andrea Schieder, an MEP from Austria, who is the standing rapporteur on the Trade and Cooperation Agreement in our Foreign Affairs Committee, and Barry Andrews, MEP from Ireland, member of the Committee on International Trade and the Constitutional Affairs Committee. Both are joined by Claire Hanna, member of the House of Commons for Belfast South from the SDLP, and Lord MP, member of the House of Lords, and sitting on its subcommittee on the Protocol on Ireland, Northern Ireland, and the former leader of the Ulster Unionist Party. As you all know, the TCA is now in force, and with our panel, we want to explore not only the governance structure of the TCA, and in particular its parliamentary dimension, the Parliamentary Partnership Assembly, which is provided for under this agreement, and whose task is to hold the executive in the Partnership Council to account. We also want to look at how other ways this body, which is still in the process of being set up, can contribute to a better understanding of legislative issues, both ongoing and future, on both sides, um, which, and this is also against the backdrop of a good number of EU single market legislation still being applicable in Northern Ireland. Mm -hmm. And finally, there is also the question, if and to what extent this body can also provide a parliamentary angle as regards the implementation of the withdrawal agreement and in particular its protocol on Northern Ireland. As said, preliminary work and contacts for setting up this parliamentary partnership assembly are underway in both parliaments. Discussions about its remit and competence are at an early stage, but hopefully will lead to having its constitutive meeting after the summer break. And I'm sure that this discussion today can inform and influence this process. So there are many questions, and without further ado, I will hand over to our moderator, Emmett Ryan from the Business Post from Ireland, who will lead us through this discussion. Thank you very much all for joining. Thank you very much, Susanna, for that lovely introduction. And thank you for joining us wherever you are. And it's also a surprisingly sunny Dublin here as well. So I think we got lucky with the weather folks for this event where most of us are indoors, but hopefully some of you are enjoying the sunshine while watching this. We have an extraordinary panel today. Andreas Schieder, of course, mentioned will be coming up shortly, followed by Barry Andrews. Then we have Claire Hanna from the SDLP and Lord MP. And certainly his last but certainly not least. It's an extraordinary amount of experience really on the panel today, which I think is going to make this particularly interesting because obviously we have a topic here which is, well, topical, being blunt about it. It's been all, it's been everywhere the last few weeks and uh, it's one which I know is going to re require a lot of nuance as well as a lot of debate in working out how best to make things go forward. If you want to ask your questions, and please do, put them in the comments as early and often as you like. We really want to make a show about you as much as it is about me and our four guests. So please send them in via YouTube and Facebook comments, and we will certainly be trying to get through as many of them as possible throughout this event. But without further ado, it's my great pleasure to welcome aboard the first speaker for this afternoon, and that is Andreas Schieder. He is an MEP from Austria. Andreas, welcome. And I, like I was saying, it's a pretty topical time right now. Yeah, thank you, and uh, good afternoon or uh, good day to everybody. It is also exceptionally a sunny, sunny summer day in Brussels, even so. We we are also not used to this, so we see we already have a lot of in, in, in common also on these places. But uh, to be uh, quickly, but maybe to go back a little bit on the TCA and uh, what was uh, the purpose. We should not forget uh, that uh, the Brexit decision was taken and one day, <coughs> even if it is a mistake, which I'm strictly convinced, uh, you have to accept uh, what it is and to find an agreement which is, let's say, uh, controlling the negative impact, especially for employed people, for the environment and for the economy and, of course, also for the citizens uh, uh, themselves. So it is not an end uh, agreement, it's a starting agreement, which is uh, creating the basis also for future 
uh, fair corporations and you know, based on clear rules and uh, good uh, cooperation. Uh, but we have also to say uh, that it is a little bit complicated because uh, the inner British debate is very much on we want to have Brexit on any price, but not so much uh, defining what exactly the post-Brexit world should look like. So this is where we stand now. The TCA is uh, through, but there are still a lot of uh, issues uh, uh, open. So. Uh, well, then uh, maybe coming late a little bit also on, on Ireland, but it's of course the EU wanted to protect the high EU standards, uh, to wanted to, that th there is a continuation of the Paris climate goals and the, the general uh, climate approaches, and also of course that the cooperation in uh, research and Horizon Europe and this is, is continuing. We regret that, for example, students exchange in Erasmus Plus uh, was not possible due to uh, uh, the British uh, UK uh, side. So we we will uh, see how, how this continues in the future. But until now, there is, is no Brexit and also no cooperation in defense and security issues. So these two are uh, waiting to be done. Meanwhile, also, of course, uh, some uh, uh, problems uh, were showing up in the concrete how it is working in the everyday life because uh, we have to say that for the UK side it was extremely important to keep also the premises of the uh, Good Friday Agreement on the on the uh, Ireland Protocol so to uh, draw a specific attention on these kind of issues and of course there the problem is uh, the details and how to start living on this. Additionally to to this, also it, I think it was uh, sadly proving that the European integration is also a, a, a history of peace because the latest developments in Belfast and so on, of course, are, are turning away from a peaceful uh, settlement and, and brought back the issues of, of riots, which uh, is a very sad uh, issue. And uh, we see that this is very unnecessary, but showing that... Uh, how complicated uh, things, of course, now in the post-Brexit world also became. Secondly, there is a lot of other unsolved issues, like uh, the fishery issues uh, recently, uh, the everyday trade on the neighborhood relations, like uh, 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 supermarkets, uh, deliveries, and things like, like this. So still the implementation is a big issue. And there we come that... Uh, this is one of the big discussed issues between the European Union and uh, the UK authorities. Uh, and I think, therefore, it is extremely important also to bring us parliamentarians closer into the game, because uh, let's say the driving seat now is uh, from the European side, Maros Shevkovic, which I think is continuing the good work also of Michel Panier. And I have a huge amount of trust into Maros' uh, work capacity. And on the other side is uh, uh, David Frost, uh, which uh, has to also to help that these relations are unfrozen and, and becoming a more vital one, which is... Quite a nice name when you think about it for getting things unfrozen, Andreas, David Frost. Uh, so <laughs> and I just want to touch on something you mentioned there, which was that Erasmus aspect, because as someone who did the Erasmus in the UK from Ireland, even thinking about that, that... If I was doing it today, I'd have to, you know, I'd have to go somewhere other than Aberdeen, where I developed so many great memories. It is quite sad to think about. And um, we're we are getting some great questions in. Please do keep them coming in through Facebook and YouTube. We'll get to them in not too long. But next, I need to bring in Barry Andrews, who is an MEP for Dublin, indeed, for where I live. So, Barry, welcome aboard. And uh, it's been quite like I was, you were saying with Andreas, an interesting time. Well, I hope I can rely on your vote, Emma, uh, for the next election. <laughs> Um, let me say, uh, just on, uh, I agree with everything Andreas just mentioned, I'll just talk a little bit about the governance of the agreement. Um, although it's not a mixed agreement uh, by definition, it has many of the characteristics of a mixed agreement. And what I mean by that is that there are areas that are not just EU competence that are in the trade and cooperation agreement. So, uh, strictly speaking, there was an argument that it should have been ratified in the national parliaments of the member states and not just ratified in the European Parliament. Uh, but it was obviously uh, after the fact that ratification took place and best practice is to have ratification before 
um, it comes into force. Uh, but that wasn't possible on this occasion. It did happen in the UK Parliament, but not in the European Parliament. So there's much more to come in, in terms of building a partnership with the EU and the UK for the future. And I, I hope that we can get to a much better relationship very soon. Um, so it is really critical that we develop a, a governance structure and parliamentary scrutiny to go with that. Now, the governance structure is stitched into the agreement, uh, both in the trade cooperation agreement, where there, I think there's 19 committees under, under the Joint uh, Partnership Council, and then under the uh, withdrawal agreement and the uh, Joint Committee, there's a further six uh, committees. So if this isn't uh, enough institutional architecture, here in the European Parliament, even the, today, I believe, uh, discussions are going on to, uh, with the leaders in the European Parliament about the exact structure of oversight. Essentially, there'll be three elements to this. There will be a normal delegation to the UK from the European Parliament in due course, which will be a permanent feature. Um, secondly, there will be membership of the Parliamentary Partnership Assembly. And it's possible that the, these will be the same people. In other words, those who are on the UK delegation will also be the members on the European side uh, on, on the Assembly. And the final part, a temporary arrangement, will be uh, a scrutiny body to oversee the trade and cooperation agreement for the next uh, one or two years. And currently there is a UK coordination group, which is based on the groups here in the European Parliament. Uh, but that will be replaced and the personnel on that depending on what's agreed between the leaders, will be the chair of the Trade Committee, the chair of the Foreign Affairs Committee, chairman of the coordinators group, uh, and, ver and one person from the, each of the rapporteurs and one from each group. So there'll be about 25 people in that group uh, if that is agreed. Um, and the final thing, Emma, just by way of introduction, is to say that I've been working quite a bit on developing um, a relationship, as I called it, connective tissue between the Northern Ireland Assembly and the European Parliament directly, because Northern Ireland is going to be directly impact, impacted by EU law on the single market and for goods. And it is important that the Assembly has the earliest possible upstream visibility on potential uh, laws that may, may impact the operation of single market in Northern Ireland. Um, I understand that this is a, an enormously sensitive area, but I, I believe there is a, a sufficient um, motivation for this to come about in due course. I mean, there, the other issues around the protocol will have to be settled first. There's no question of doubt about that. But any other uh, country that is impacted by EU laws like uh, Norway, Liechtenstein and Iceland have an institutional arrangement directly with the European Union. And that is something that I think that will be beneficial to all of the communities in Northern Ireland due course in it. And thank you very much for that, Barry. And I think that nicely leads to our next speaker, Claire Hanna, who has experienced both in the Legislative Assembly in the Northern Ireland and also in Westminster, as where she's currently sitting as an MP. Claire Hanna from the SLP, thanks very much for joining us here. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, and I'm glad to be here. And it is it is timely and it's good that we're looking at some of the nuts and bolts as well as the, the politics of the protocol, which have been ever present. And I know we'll, we'll, we'll talk about the politics as well. Um, we are, as as uh, as the others have said, we are left with a very, very complex um, uh, set of arrangements. I am old enough to remember when, when Brexit was sold as being about uh, ending red tape and we are left with um, with with a very difficult um, uh, web and I, and I suppose still being established. And I know, as you say, I... I um, currently sit on the Northern Ireland Affairs Committee and we are uh, acutely aware of the kind of b both the volume of, of 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 issues that need to 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 be seen and observed and engaged with but also the, the range of directions from which they're coming and the fact that there aren't currently simple mechanisms in place that kind of flag up when when there is something that requires that attention or or, or some change in Parliament and also very acutely aware of 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 the pressure and responsibility it puts on the assembly and and I think history will remind us how 
unfortunate it was that there wasn't an assembly during those kind of um, Brexit years uh, uh, after 2016 when we were designing uh, and looking at, at, at possible solutions. But um, I, I, there are so many um, departments and so on uh, within the assembly that need to be in, engaged on this. And it is fair to say it is not a, a, a political body that has the most tremendous um, reputation when it comes to uh, scrutiny and and, and and good governance. And it's also fair to say that the will isn't um, there from everybody to, to make things work. So we are in a very challenging situation. So it, it will need um, kind of um, uh, willing and, and, and smarts from all of those bodies. I can also acknowledge concerns though about about the democratic um, deficit. And again, we, 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 were, we were told Brexit or the EU had a democratic deficit in built, but it didn't really. And, and, the, and the UK had very strong say and sway in decisions, but it has been replaced with an actual, um, you know, de democratic gap and it, not to refight the last war, but it's it's worth saying the SDLP and others really worked extremely hard with every possible parliamentary and legal um, way of hardwiring consent and roles for the democratic and the devolved institutions here um, into the Brexit process. And we were rebuffed. You know, we tried to put, um, you know, cognizance of, 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 of the Northern Ireland institutions onto the face of the legislation. And, and that was blocked by some of those who, who are most vocal now um, about um, about about the, the gap in, in oversight. And it's also worth saying that we went to court to argue, um, you know, the, about the disequilibrium that any a solution that put a border in either direction would cause. And again, we were told that actually, no, the consent aspects of the Good Friday Agreement only referred essentially to constitutional change as a result of a referendum. And again, some of those who are now uh, talking about consent, you know, cheered that ruling and cheered when we when we lost uh, th that case. Um, so, you know, the, the kind of the the the, the uh, the the macro consent mechanism, which is Article 18 in the protocol, you know, is is suboptimal for for a lot of reasons. One that people, you know, some feel that it doesn't give them, um, you know, maybe a veto for progress, and also it is challenging for businesses to allow them to adequately plan. Um, if you know any five year plan would have to involve some of these, uh, some of these um potential um potential kind of cutoff moments. Um, we'll probably pick up it in the conversation, but there are uh, other mechanisms that we can design in. Both the Good Friday Agreement and the protocol are dynamic uh, agreements and they're, and they're designed to be able to evolve. And we've been arguing that the Good Friday Agreement isn't an ornament on your mantelpiece. You know, there's there's lots of tools and mechanisms that can be used. For example, Strand 2, paragraph 17, it explicitly allows for the North-South Ministerial Council to be a, a, a used um, to advance issues that are under the locus of, of, of the European Union. So basically, it, it, is, it is going to be enormously challenging. And as I say, it's going to require everybody to want to make things work and that's something um, that is still a work in progress, but look forward to uh, the discussion. Thanks. That's great, Claire. Thanks very much. And speaking of the discussion, I'm looking for forward to everyone taking part and being involved. Please get your comments in and questions in via Facebook and YouTube or wherever you're watching us today. And our last guest, because given Claire mentioned the Good Friday Agreement, his experience obviously include working on that. He is a former leader of the UUP and was also acting first minister of Northern Ireland. It's Lord MP. Lord MP, welcome aboard. And these are times where I think we need a bit, a bit of organisation and a bit of focus. Hi, Emmett, um, and good afternoon to you and to our guests. Yes, um, I, I think uh, we started off uh, mentioning relationships between the EU and uh, the UK, and I do not believe that we have a sufficiently <clears throat> developed relationship at the moment. I think there's a lot of tension um, and it does seem to me that until we get that relationship right, it's going to be very difficult to solve a lot of the other problems that we have. If I could look at relationships between the parliaments, uh, I'm a member of the British Irish Parliamentary Assembly, uh, which of course covers all of the uh, elected bodies right throughout the United Kingdom and beyond. In other words, the islands, Isle of Man, uh, Scotland, Wales, the devolved administrations are all around the table uh, and have a have a meet ha have meetings regularly and cooperate. Similarly, I'm a member of the British American Parliamentary Group, 
and we have meetings and a structure uh, to keep these relationships going. So I think that is going to have to develop, uh, I believe, uh, over time. But I think it's an essential um, component of building a relationship that works. Now, I'm a member of the uh, European Union uh, subcommittee that is dealing with the protocol uh, on Ireland, Northern Ireland, and it, it's it's got uh, quite a lot of people on it with a huge amount of experience. It is chaired by Lord Jay, former UK ambassador to Paris, and a former um, se se uh, former permanent secretary in the Foreign Office in London. So, a very very experienced person, and it's got some high-ranking people on it. So it's been taken extremely seriously. We've already commenced evidence sessions um, from business and community leaders, and we will have uh, probably an interim report about July, but we will be running right through to the end of 2022 uh, monitoring uh, this. As someone who was involved in negotiating the um, Good Friday Agreement, I have to say that when I look at the, comp at the problems we have to be confronted with, um, I just cannot believe that we cannot do things better than we're currently doing. Um, I believe that the a volume of trade that's involved in European terms, I think, is about one tenth of one percent. And um, there is, of course, a matter of principle in that, uh, the protection of the single market. And totally accept that, totally understand that. But I believe that we have far too complicated a set of arrangements uh, that um, are actually have the potential to cause not only economic damage, but I think uh, serious political damage as well. Um, Claire referred to the democratic deficit. Um, we have a situation where rules will be made for us in Brussels over which we have no say. And uh, you may make the point that that's a co downstream consequence of Brexit, but um, the fact of the matter is that my party and others um, didn't support Brexit, but we accepted a UK-wide decision uh, to leave the European Union, and we have to implement that decision uh, in the best interests of, of, of people. So I, I think that there are so many things, and Claire referred to using the agreement and its structures, and I am a great supporter of that idea. I think there's huge potential uh, out there. I think we can fix things, um, but I think we are going to have to take more responsibility, uh, both at Stormont and it may require some devolution of powers to Stormont to actually do this. But I think there are ways. And if we could solve um, problems in the late 1980s, and uh, Barry Andrews referred earlier to the involvement of his father uh, as an uh, Irish minister, senior minister at that time, if we could solve those problems and have them ratified by the people, I cannot believe that we cannot resolve these matters, but it needs the goodwill. There needs to be a good relationship between London and Brussels to allow that to, ta to happen. Thanks very much, Lord Embry, for that. I have good news and I got bad news for our speakers. The good news is you all did great. The bad news is as a result, we have a lot of questions to get through for all of you. So we will hopefully, hopefully be able to get in as many as possible. And our first comes from Peter Burke. Peter is a, from Oxford for Europe. And he's got a great question, which is to what extent is the current unrest a direct result of Brexit slash the Northern Ireland Protocol? And to what extent is that being used by criminal elements, e.g. drug gangs as a pretext? I'll go to Claire first on this one, I think. That's it. Um, look, I think I think there's there's a lot in that, and and I I um uh, last week at our committee we had a young man give evidence, a 19 year old as part of the LCC, and and the story that arose from that was um the same young man saying that violence wouldn't be taken off the table. Um, but there's a there's a news clip of Joel Keyes who'd been involved in in or, or peripheral to the riots uh, around Easter, and he what he said then really stuck with me. He said. I don't really know anything about the protocol. Um, I don't know much about the COVID regulations because it's in the back of the Bobby Story funeral issue. But my political leaders keep telling me that we're losing. So I, I think it is, uh, and the phrase that is, keeps being used is the straw that broke the camel's back. So it is undoubtedly, um, uh, and, and I don't, I'm not denying that the, 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 you know, the real concern um, about about the protocol. But it is embroiled with many, many issues in in, in that there's a community of people who think that um, they've been losing for many years. 
I think they think that because they've been told repeatedly and they've been sold a very, very negative, um, I, I won't go so far as to say um, vision. Um, so yes, I think I, I think that that is part of um, the issue. Brexit has been sold um, as a loss and 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 this um, uh, you know interface between Northern Ireland and Britain. And I can genuinely understand borders have symbolic value, and that's a point that the SDLP has been making for years, which is why any Brexit outcome that had a border in either direction was going to be terrible and why we begged and begged and begged those with influence not to to bring us this outcome but yes it is it is being exploited there are many many um administrative differences between britain and northern ireland and all sorts of social and economic uh, and 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 political issues that that don't appear to be diminishing people's britishness that's as i say not to t not to take away the value but i have no doubt in my mind that it is being exploited and manipulated both at a political level and indeed at a ground level and in some instances uh, in in the way that your questioner re reveals if you map out where the most street disorder occurred um yes there's an overlay as as well where uh, police enforcement against against the the narco paramilitaries uh, occurred at the same time I, I i i don't say that to erase um the genuine um uh, uh, upset that there is but there's undoubtedly um exacerbation and manipulation and just keep that quote in your mind and our leaders keep telling us that we're losing. I just want to bring in Lord MP on this because obviously I'm sure you've got some thoughts on this particular question. Yeah, it, it's it's these things are never one dimensional. And um, as Claire said, there are a number of issues. In in fact, here there was a, an issue over the uh, co terminus with the operation. Of the protocol was a decision by the prosecuting authorities here not to prosecute um, 24 Sinn Féin politicians for participation breaking COVID rules in the um, in the Bobby Story IRA funeral. So there's a whole range of issues. Um, however, you've also got to remember that the um, on a recent on a visit to Northern Ireland, um, the Prime Minister told people and told businessmen that if the, if you were uh, had to fill in papers and so on to move your goods around, just throw it in the bin. Uh, and of course, mm -hmm. then we set up a whole structure. Uh, where people are uh, climbing under um, tractors and agricultural machinery to see if there's any Scottish soil on it and to remove it. You know, it, it's sort of the the backdrop against which the, this thing has been introduced. It was introduced with 12 hours notice on the 1st of January, um, clearly not prepared. Uh, businesses had to react on the hoof. Um, and we've had a number of, of issues in it, and, and of course we had the 29th of January issue when when the, the um, decision of the Commission to effectively bring in a border in Ireland out of the blue without even telephoning the Taoiseach, that was made, now it was reversed, and I'm glad it was reversed, but it, it, it brought in an element of instability. Now there has been some violence, it's by Northern Ireland standards, it hasn't been widespread or it has it has ceased, but there are daily not, or nightly demonstrations going on, but they have been relatively peaceful. So we can't underestimate the potential, particularly as we have elections next year, for this issue. This is going to be up front and centre. Uh, so we have a very tricky situation on our hands and uh, we have a lot of instability in the governing parties. Uh, and I think that uh, we're in a tough time, but we don't mustn't lose hope. The one thing I have learnt, and I'm sure Claire's party has learnt as well, that one thing you must not do is leave a political vacuum in the Irish situation. Politicians from both sides and both governments have to be engaged. And I have to say, as often as the case, quite frequently they've walked away, they thought things were settled and they've disappeared over the horizon and left people to it. And I think that lesson has still not been learned. Well, we have a politician who actually has engaged with us in the chat, believe it or not. Uh, Richard Corbett, former MEP, he's got a question which I'm going to bring to Andreas first, and that is, wasn't the protocol a risky concession by the EU placing its external economic border into the territory of a third country, trusting that the country, UK, it would apply necessary customs and regulatory checks? Yes and no, and first maybe let me say also it's, it's nice to, to, to see Richard again because he was a very 
a very important colleague in the European Parliament, which uh, did a, a, a extremely good work uh, there for, for the United Kingdom, and we miss him, which is also one of the negative impacts of, of, of Brexit. But why do I say yes and no? Because it is clear, you can't be in and out at once, so there must be a border somewhere. So, and it, is, it was also clear from the beginning on that the European Union has to protect its interest in its single market, not to allow any loopholes. So, the concession is true. It is a concession to put this kind of border, uh, let's say, in the Irish Sea and uh, try, of course, to work on to have as less border as necessary because. There, of course, you can have a hard border. You can also put some of the controls uh, somewhere in the production line and things like this. You, you can put a lot of everyday transport also in the field of trust. Uh, but this is not working now because also, uh, unluckily, the British side was not uh, uh, eager enough to, to establish the necessary authorities. And of course, at the end, it is also about filling in uh, stupid papers and things like this. But... Honestly, this was clear from the beginning of the debate that when you are out, of course, then all the, the, the duty issues in, in one or another side starts again. And it's not, you, as, as, as I said before, you can't be in and out at once. This was the miracle which the Brexiteers tried to tell everybody that there will be an out with any negative impact, which is not true. This is what we see now. Uh, if somebody is against this, she send, should send a thank you, a negative thank you telegram to the Brexiteers. Uh, Barry, I'd like to ask you about this one as well. What are your own thoughts on this question? Well, uh, uh, yeah, I, I think that um, there, there really isn't an alternative. I mean, the UK-wide backstop was rejected three times in Westminster. Um, and, and I don't really understand what the, what the alternative could be uh, given that position. Uh, but but Richard is right. Its implementation is it falls to the responsibility of the United Kingdom. Uh, infrastructure uh, of some sort will eventually have to be uh, created, and that is going to be a very difficult situation. And it has to be done sensitively. However, as I understand it, a, a large amount of progress is being made. And recent reports indicate that the medicines issue, which is one of the thorniest of the 25 issues identified in relation to the protocol. Uh, is close to resolution, um, and but the, uh, the the other big issue is is um, uh, food safety and animal health, the SPS area, which is uh, I don't think is as as close. But I, I totally agree with what Lord Ampey says. You know, the the previous generation overcame a series of problems of that that were edu I was educated to understand that they were intractable in university. That's what they used to say about it. But the wit and the energy and the capital was invested um, by people who were real leaders um, to overcome those problems. And uh, I have confidence that, that, the, that we can overcome these issues in the protocol. And I do hope that we get to a point where Northern Ireland uh, begins to strategize ways to take advantage of the opportunities that come with being both in the UK single market and having access to the EU single market, a very unique position which could deliver prosperity with the people living there, which could deliver inward investment, which is currently suspended. I think a lot of decisions to invest in Northern Ireland are being held up pending the outcome of what's happening now. So I, I would be more confident for the future, and it's, uh, I must say. Thanks very much for that, Barry. Our third question today comes from Shauna McGeehan. She is uh, the uh, EU officer at the NI Assembly, and she's got a great question here, which I'm really enjoying, actually. It's, can or how can NI views be considered in EU proposals at an early stage rather than when they reach the legislative stage? And I'm actually just going to go back to Barry on that one, because I'd actually love to get your thoughts on this, Barry. Yeah, I think the area that uh, I, I've already mentioned, and I, I, you know, I'd, I'd rather hear Lord MP would say about it, and uh, because I've spoken to Claire about it, and I think this idea of connective tissue between the Northern Ireland Assembly and the European Parliament directly is logical because that's what happens with other countries, third countries that we have that are impacted by EU law. They have direct institutional links. I think the other area is in the um, the joint consultative working group, which is under the specialised committee in the in the withdrawal agreement. That currently consists of representatives of the UK governments and the European uh, the European uh, Union, but I think there's space in there for experts 
uh, from civil society, from Northern Ireland, from academics, from business leaders to bring direct input into the joint consultative working group. It is supposed to meet on a monthly basis. It's not just a, a, a little committee, an echo chamber of any sort. It brings real expertise into this space. And I think that is one entry point in the existing architecture that could improve Northern Ireland's upstream visibility of uh, regulation and directives that may impact in Northern Ireland in the future. And uh, naturally, I'd like to go to Lord Empey from this for your own thoughts on this question. Well, I, I did say in my earlier remarks that um, I think as part of a, 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 an overall solution, Stormont may require some further devolution because at the moment it doesn't have any locus uh, effectively. It has the implementation of some of the downstream consequences, but the higher level is a Westminster matter. And I mean, I don't think there's any doubt about that. Uh, but I believe that um, while, of course, a sovereign government will always um, uh, will always retain its ability to um, decide what's happening on its own territory. There is no reason why it couldn't license the Northern Land Assembly uh, to actually carry out some functions on its behalf. Mm -hmm. And uh, that, uh, because it, while we may have upstream meetings, as Barry said, and, and um, so on, the fact is there is a democratic deficit in it, no matter how you work around consultations and so on, if somebody somewhere can decide what happens in your patch and you don't have a say in it, that's a big problem. So I think the way to solve that is in, in part using and even having to create maybe new mechanisms within the structure of the agreement, the Good Friday Agreement, but also it may require some devolution uh, to actually resolve that. And of course, the problem with, if it is not addressed now, it will grow over time because as trade deals are done, while regulations don't change very fast in Europe or indeed in any other country, over time, inevitably they will. So if the problem isn't addressed now, the longer we wait, the more the gap will become. And at some point they will be very serious. And um, that's what I think we have to avoid. And I, naturally, thanks very much for that, uh, Reg. And I want to move on to Claire Hanna for your own thoughts on this. Sorry. Yeah, I, I, I agree. And I must say, I really appreciate, you know, Barry, I know, has been has been working away on this, you know, and trying to be uh, creative and, and, and design in uh, opportunities. And I don't disagree with a lot of what uh, he, he and Lord MP have said. I mean, there is a, a, an onboard democratic deficit for us. Obviously, we, we, we are subject to a lot of decisions, even from Westminster, not least uh, Brexit and this form of Brexit um, that we, we, we haven't really had sufficient um, insight. I think it is about the will to making it work and both Barry and Reg spoke about previous challenges that have been overcome but that was because you have as I said political leaders who wanted to make it work the fact is we we we, we have to you know all of the all of the better options were were rejected um, and even and I know the kind of snake oil salesmen who, who have pretended that there are other um, ways of doing this are also pretending that if you just flick a switch and knock the protocol off off, um, everything will go back to the way it was um, when, when obviously it, it, it won't and it creates a whole separate amount of problems. But it really does come back down to um, those in political power wanting um, to find a workable arrangement and not just seeking to use um, the, 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 the concerns legitimate and otherwise about this as a campaigning mechanism. And I don't think we're there yet. Thanks, thanks very much for that, Claire. Our next question comes from John Pete from The Economist. His question is, isn't the best answer an EU-UK veterinary agreement like the Swiss one? And why is the UK so resistant to this idea? And I'm going to go to Andreas first on this. I, no, I think John Pete is right. The veterinary agreement would be extremely helpful for a lot of these issues which we discussed before. And the Swiss one is existing but still also in this the swiss one of course has the problem if there is any further development in the veterinary issues inside the european union then of course it is uh, dynamically also applying to this agreement uh so it has to be clear then there will be also an 
implementation of, of rules which come from 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 the European Union, but in, in generally yes. But with Switzerland and the UA, U, European Union, we have something like a veterinary uh, area, a shared veterinary area. Uh, I, I haven't heard that this uh, is in in the interest of the UK. It would be good if it would be. And uh, Claire's want to go to you on this. Yeah, to you. <laughs> I mean, I, I just I couldn't I couldn't agree more. This is the closest thing we have to uh, a silver bullet in this in 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 this um, discussion. This whole debate, this whole protocol, you know, these divergences are in order to allow the UK to have a power to diverge that it insists that it isn't going to use and it doesn't want to use. And, you know, again, some of it com comes around to this. These are about choices. And I know we've created the narrative here that the main old, you know, Dublin and nationalists and Remainers and Brussels have voiced this upon upon the people of North Northern Ireland. And it does all flow um, from UK decisions. And I suppose um, while I can, I suppose, understand why why some of the Brexit ultras in, in, in London who, who I think do have visions around, you know, deregulation and 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 moving uh, the UK's economy into a very different place and one that I don't think um, is is desirable or acceptable to, to most people. Um, for for people here um, who who decry the protocol, not to be chasing this and running after it with with every fibre of their being, being is absolutely insane, particularly when the same people are are expressing concerns about um the impact of 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 the the Australia trade deal and obviously what that will signal about future trade deals. I mean, it, 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 witness after witness after witness to the Northern Ireland Affairs Committee, you know, from business, from trade, from all, are, are making clear that it would address, you know, 80 to 85 uh, percent of, of checks. And it would also uphold um, the food standards and, and, and other standards that, 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 that people on both sides of the Irish Sea um, value. So we just have to hold that in our head. You know, the, the solution to this is the UK deciding they keep telling us they don't want to drop standards um but refusing uh, opportunities to 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 confirm that in legislation and um really this this could could all go away so it's very frustrating that it isn't um being uh, that it isn't that it hasn't already been agreed, and that particularly, um, for example, the DUP uh, he, here aren't aren't asking for it and are willing to to make all sorts of other claims and 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 threats and predictions uh, and won't invest their energy in in achieving this outcome. And I can see Lord MP wants to get in. this, I get the impression. Uh, yes, uh, Emmett. Um, look, I, I I take the point about the scale and the 80, 80, 85 percent. Uh, etc. But there is no circumstances that I can envisage in the current parliament that the government will agree to dynamic alignment, full stop. Uh, I just don't see it. It's um, almost an act of religious observance. For some people, they won't agree to it. That does not mean that the door is closed to a veterinary agreement of some description. Uh, but the Swiss model, in my judgment, isn't a flyer. And while it would solve an enormous number of our problems, uh, it's just as a matter of principle for the people who have promoted uh, the Brexit theory for the last, in some cases, some of them have been working on it for 40 years. Uh, they're not going to do it. This government is not going to do it. In fact, we had a question uh, to Lord Frost on, uh, I think it was Thursday of last week, and this particular question arose and the answer was very clear they're not doing it i i believe that to be the case i just don't think it was a off the comp answer from him i think in principle they're not going to do it that does not mean that all i veterinary agreements could are out the window i think there are uh, certainly a, a willingness to look at al alternatives but not the swiss model can i, I just uh, uh, sorry, we are just trying to get as many questions in as possible, but I, I do appreciate that. Uh, our next question comes in from Simon Usherwood, and it's a, definitely one I think for both uh, Red, Lord Empey, sorry, and Claire, and that is to what extent can the current extent of the TCA produce a stable EU-UK relationship, or are significant new elements needed? Simon Usherwood, sorry. Um, and if we could go to Lord Empey on that first, please. Yeah, well, I believe that it, at a diplomatic level, the relationship is not where it should be. And that is because both sides are sore. We've had disputes, we've had arguments, uh, we've had finger pointing, 
um, and we've had unilateral decisions from both sides, and that has soured the atmosphere after a very brittle several years of dispute. Uh, my point, initial point was that relationship has to be put right, in my view, so that other things can flow from it. Because if there's a good, solid, working, friendly relationship, I think so many more things are possible. But when things are so brittle as they are right now, I would say that is um, a negative factor. But it, it is, I think, if we could get that relationship right, then I think there's a huge number of possibilities that we could pursue um, to our mutual benefit and which would uh, assist us particularly in, in, on the island of Ireland in resolving what could be a very tricky situation. And if we're looking over the horizon, which I think we have to be doing, rather than concentrating on, on, on what's immediately in front of us, if we're looking over the horizon, I see that improving relationship as an absolutely essential element because it was the improving relationships between the London government and the Dublin government that enabled us uh, to achieve the Belfast Agreement with the help of others, including the European Union and the US. But just that core relationship must be improved if we are to build foundations for compromise. And uh, that's a great answer, to, uh, Lord MB. And if we got to clear on that, please. Yeah, I mean, I agree with a lot of that, particularly as well, to, for things to work here. Certainly, in more, you know, Dublin and London have to be cooperating as 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 friends and and as equals. And I agree that the relationship is in a very a poor place, but I think it also does have to be recognised, you know, for us to move on from this. And I appreciate Reg has been consistent and constructive on this. But what you've just said, and you're you're right to say that it doesn't look like the UK would agree this because they just, in the face of all logic, fundamentally um, don't want to do it because of 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 their 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 you said article of faith on 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 break on Brexit. But it's that lack of understanding that the EU also have you know I, I suppose a, a vision and a, an organisation. I'm not saying you lack this understanding, but that the EU also have a right to have um, political wants and needs from 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 their coherent relationship. And and I just fear that um and and I'm sure I'm sure Brexiters would say it's the same from the EU that um they're calling for flexibility but saying you know we we won't budge on this principle even if literally nobody can identify why the principle is so important or, or what uh, what they want to diverge on and I think uh, and I fear particularly Frost just intends to mine this for grievance and I suppose uh, you know if this is the TCA and this is the future way that we're going to operate every further divergence and uh, fr from from the UK if that's what they choose to do um of course um hardens um hardens the the the, the, tr the trade barriers um to, to here and indeed to the to the rest of the EU in ways and makes this uh, more difficult so I don't really see how that square uh, is going to be uh, that circle is going to be squared I don't see how that's going to be improved until there is that kind of understanding that the EU has um you know has a set of rules and, and and a right to to expect them to be to be upheld so it's it's not a it's not an optimistic prospect given that we're going to diverge further well I want to go to Andreas on this because he was wants and needs Andreas it's worth asking what those wants and needs are and how you see this question uh I, I think maybe after summer when uh, also we can start uh, traveling again, which I think that the meeting of real people also is maybe helpful to, to calm down some problems. And then we urgently need to establish this uh, parliamentary partnership assembly, which could be one helpful because it's less governmental, it's more parliamentarians outspoken, and then we, we hope that this will work. But... Also, we have to say, of course, in the next years, there will be developments in the European Union, in the Green Deal, uh, other issues, which, of course, will open new questions of uh, how how the connections uh, will, will function. But anyway, that's why uh, politicians exist uh, and they need to talk to each other. Then things might get better anyway. 
Excellent answer. Uh, I think most people will always appreciate an answer that ends quite like that. Our next question comes from Bill Roger, who is from the European Movement in Scotland, and it is that the noises coming from Stormont don't seem to indicate that the political will to, to take the protocol, make the protocol work, sorry, is strong. How can that best be tackled? I'm going to go to Barry first on this, just because he's got that view, obviously, with both the paternal experience, but also his own work in cross-border work over the years as a junior minister in the Irish government in the past. Well, I'm not sure I am best placed to answer the question. I think certainly Claire and uh, Lord Enby would be better better placed um, to you know to, to, to tackle that question. You're, you're very um, modest. You know, very well. <laughs> well, no, I look. I mean, there's lots of other aspects of it. I mean, they, look. I, I think that there are assembly elections next year. We have just had two leadership changes at the DUP and the UUP. Um, so there's a lot of uh, impact of what's happened over the last six months. And, you know, it's going to be a fairly febrile environment. Um, but I totally agree with the previous speakers. You know, the proximity that is missing between Dublin and London, for example, that, you know, John Major said that the Good Friday Agreement emerged from the margins of European Council meetings, discussions he had with Albert Reynolds. You know, lots of people would take them credit, but there's a huge amount that needs to be replaced in terms of proximity. And it includes all of the other elements of the Good Friday Agreement, the North-South elements, the East-West elements. Um, and and I, I would say, uh, just uh, if I might say, Emmett, on the previous question, there's more to EU-UK relations than uh, the, the, the trade agreement. Um, we have, you know, the G7, COP26 coming up. These are situations in which the UK are going to need uh, support from the European Union. But there are serious um, uh, barriers ahead as well. The UK's trade policy is diverging very substantially from uh, the EU, and the UK sees trade as a way to develop co comparative advantage, particularly in areas of data, uh, the management of, and privacy and security around data. They're taking a, a less regulatory approach than the U EU is doing. So there's going to be a lot of problems ahead, um, but the Trade and Cooperation Agreement will expand, particularly in the area of security and defence. We'll see that coming too. But I, I believe the areas uh, of expertise in the situation on the ground and in the Assembly to uh, to, to Claire and Lord MP. Absolutely. I'll go to Claire first on this. On me, I think I think the, fir the first thing is is to elect people who kind of want to make it work and even they'll disagree and, and 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 obviously there are there are people in the assembly with whom I have fundamentally um you know different views on 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 Brexit but I've said all along it's people who share power because they believe it's in the interests of the people in Northern Ireland and there are people who share power because the law tells them to so um I I know which I think um would would make this problem uh, work I think we need to see what uh evolutions can happen, what uh barnacles can be sandpapered in in the next few weeks because we know there are um, some easements that can happen and then start to see what the bottom line is uh, of, of those who are wholly opposed to, 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 to making this work. You know, if if um, the interface of the protocol in people's everyday lives can be can be smooth, I think most individuals are happy to get on with it. But obviously <clears throat> those who want to, uh, as I say, mine for grievance and, and turn the anger on and off haven't established what their bottom line is at the moment and we need to see that. And then I suppose to try and move to the, to the um, place where some of the opportunities can be realised and, and others have spoken about it. The fact that for the first time ever, Northern Ireland has a unique selling point. We are at the hinge of, of both of these uh, markets and there are real opportunities in agri-foods and advanced manufacturing and in, in, you know, green tech and, and, and many other things. And, and and if some of, we know that investors require stability, they want to know that, uh, Barry spoke about how decisions we know are kind of on ice at the moment. People want to know what the trading environment going to be and they want to know that the factory isn't going to get burnt in a riot or whatever all, all of all of all of those things so if if, if we get a clearer picture um, of of what easements we we might be able to achieve by the summer. Uh, we know the business community want to make this work. We just have to we just have to find out whether whether um uh you know, political opponents are, are prepared to 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 try and operate around it. And that's what I would say as all elect people who will who will try and make stuff work and who see mileage and solutions and not just problems. I definitely want to bring in Lord Envy here because I'm mindful of time. Um, first of all, I agree with Andreas. I think the absence of face-to-face -face meetings has been a negative factor over the past uh, 18 months. Um, it, it, the uh, position of Stormont about the operation of the protocol, obviously, as has been referred to, 
things are in a state of flux up there right now. Um, and I was up earlier on this morning uh, and, and the, there's a most peculiar atmosphere about it. Um, but I think what a lot of people don't understand is that when Boris Johnson put his proposals for an amended protocol to the European Union on the 2nd of October 2019, he included in it a regularity border in the Irish Sea, he included in it border inspection posts at Northern Ireland ports, and he included in it uh, the fact that Northern Ireland would have to, goods coming in would have to comply with European uh, rules and consequently subject to the European Court. Now, on the 2nd of October 2019, the DUP supported that. Mm -hmm. They endorsed that document. And their leader, former leader Arlene Foster, described him as a serious and sensible way forward. Now, most people were horrified <laughs> that uh, they didn't see the trap that was, they were walking into. And then, of course, 15 days later, when the protocol was actually signed off, they ran for cover. But the com key component parts of the protocol is the border in the RSC, the border inspection posts and compliance with EU rules. And the DUP backed that, every last one of them. And now, shock horror, they're re trying to lead a campaign to break, to, to, to um, talk about this evil protocol when in fact the component parts of it were what they actually agreed to. So I, I think that the wider wider people in Northern Ireland realise that you've got an international agreement here. I personally don't like it. I think it's a sledgehammer to crack a nut. I think there are alternatives. But given the mechanisms and how the European Union works, uh, which is very rules-based, very legally based, we First of all, it'll have to be divided into two component parts. We'll have to try and fix in the short term what we can fix to make things work. But I think we need a new deal, a complete new arrangement that would use the agreement of 1998 as a template with some devolution to Stormont, but it requires goodwill to work. And that's the missing link. Thank you, Lord MP. And our last question, and it's an absolute cracker here from Kelly McCobb, and it's to what extent has the tension been exacerbated by the COVID pandemic or, or is that irrelevant to political positions? And if I go to Andreas on this one first. I, I would say the COVID pandemic was not helpful, neither to our normal life nor to, to solving this problem. But the nucleus of the problem has nothing to do with the COVID pandemic. This is British homemade uh, and if we like it or not, I, I don't like it at all, the Brexit, but now we have to anyway to find a way how, how we tackle the future issues and not uh, sitting only in the past. So let's uh, roll up the sleeves and get the work done. And Barry, your own thoughts on this? From what I understood, the, 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 the sort of fiasco around Article 16 back in January, had it not been for the pandemic, I think there might have been some a lot of civil disobedience at the very least in the north of Ireland. Uh, it, it was delayed till April. Uh, but I totally agree with Andreas. I mean, this, these are much bigger issues. Um, I, I think I'd agree with his point about you know proximity, people being able to meet will help the situation. I can't wait for the Parliamentary Assembly to get going, for the, U for the delegation to the UK to get going. The, the proper scrutiny so that we can have these discussions. I've been trying to get over to London for the last 12 months to meet and to discuss these issues to get the opportunity. So, um, you know, this is holding things up, but at the core of this situation uh, is very little to do with COVID. And where are your thoughts? Yeah, I mean, to, to an extent, obviously, I mean, I fully agree about the the lack of face-to-face -face and the impact that's having. Obviously, COVID is distorting the economics of it as well and, and hiding things for, for better or worse. People can um, uh, say, oh, well, there's no negative impacts of Brexit. It's all COVID. And, but similarly, um, we, we have heard from businesses that in those first few weeks when they had been given precious little notice, if they were handling full, um, you know, full loads and if, say, hospitality and schools and all that were still going, some of the the, the food suppliers would have been really, really under pressure. So um, we, we suppose we haven't got the usual baseline economic activity um, to, 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 to sort of follow. But yeah, it's mostly about relationships and and hopefully that they can be improved face to face. And lastly, but certainly not least, Lord MP. Uh, I believe COVID has been has exacerbated things. 
uh, there are fundamentally underlying problems. They've been made worse and the ability to solve them has certainly been made worse by COVID, and, uh, but the underlying issues remain. Thank you very much. Thanks to all our panelists, Andreas, Barry, Claire, and Lord Empey for taking part. Thanks to all of you for getting your questions in throughout this. That has been absolutely fantastic to see throughout all this event. And of course, thanks to the backroom team who uh, made sure all of us came across more competent than we deserve to be throughout this event. And on that note, thank you all and have a good afternoon.